As a photographer, we are all terrified of her because she will do anything to get the shot. She's, you know, she's a slave driver. Like my kids, when I tell them Francis is coming over, they say, with a camera? And if I say no, they're like, oh, that's so cool. You know, they love her, but she will, she'll, she'll hound us. I first met Frances when she came to photograph my wife, Mary Moore. So I, I'm not sure that I was all that aware of Frances's work, but then this extraordinary person came in and started moving the house around and moving cameras into place and just did the most extraordinary series of photographs. I thought, wow. <laughs> I think it was back in 1998 that Fremantle Press and Francis first collaborated on a book called Being Australian. Last year we did uh, another book on Margaret River and it was a, quite a different book to the first one um, where she was really looking at landscape and, uh, and it was described as a, a love letter from Francis to the region that's very close to her heart. And next year we're bringing out uh, a new edition of her very uh, popular book about Perth. She's really top of her game. She's very passionate, very hardworking, one of the most hardworking photographers I've ever worked with. Um, you know, who'd get up at four in the morning just to wait for the right wave shot or, you know, to bud to flower or, or things like that. She's just so um, passionate about what she does and she captures them, the images, just so beautifully in her photography. She gets a real, a real essence and a, a real... Um, port portrayal of, of her subject that uh, happy snappers just couldn't hope to emulate. So it's no wonder she's award winning. I met Frances uh, as a result of uh, a journalist giving me her phone number and how that came about is uh, I just finished a documentary called Saving Andrew Mallard and uh, the Sunday Times uh, magazine uh, interviewed me uh, about the film and uh, the journalist was asking me a lot of questions and uh, at one stage, her question starting, started to get a little personal and, she, uh, and I said, look, I, I'm happy to talk about the film, but I don't want to talk about my personal life. And she said, well, let me ask just one question. Are you attached at the moment? And as it happened, I'd uh, just broken up with my girlfriend and uh, so I said, well, as it happens, I'm single. And she said, well, look, uh, I know this photographer called Frances and uh, I reckon I'd, I'd love you to meet her. Uh, she's single at the moment as well and uh, here's her phone number and uh, look, just give her a ring and have a cup of coffee and see how you go. So uh, some days later I uh, did give her a ring and uh, we met in a coffee shop and uh, I guess that journalist's hunch was correct because some eight years later we're still together. I'm a photographer that's not studio based. I rarely have to use a studio in when you, obviously my work is all over the state. So the state is my studio. Hello. This is my office. This is where um, all the images are now produced because as Photographers now, you don't drop stuff into a lab. I've been a working photographer for just over 30 years. I started photography uh, when I was 18. Fabulous. What are we up to? Mm. Have you got the so selection down yet? Yeah, so we've got about... I was at Teachers College and a photography student wanted a model to be in some pictures for an assignment for him. And I was really not at ease being photographed, hence why I'm so patient with people I photograph. But, you know, that didn't appeal to me at all. I was much more interested in, you know, I was helping him in the dark room and then I thought that's where the magic was. And, you know, it just instantly there was like, my vocation was found and when I finished teaching I always did uh, animation and photography with school children. That became a specialty, teaching media studies. And then after I had my first child, I thought, oh, this would be good as a part-time job. Little did I know. We both worked for the Weekend Australian magazine for, gosh, probably, I was a columnist for the magazine for 12 years, and I also wrote feature stories. 
So I guess we worked together over, you know, a period of more than a decade. What about the clothesline book? Okay, I'm excited about that. It's meant <laughs> You're to be. Write something witty. Something yeah, witty, really okay. Like. Francis took many family shots uh, for the magazine, but also for Family Circle, which I was writing for at the time, because I would often write about my family, which was quite young. Single mom, three kids. And I've been on shoots with her where we did one that was about kind of dads, the changing role of fathers in Australian society kind of thing. And um, we had this little boy, he was four years old, and his dad on a skateboard. And uh, they must have been on that skateboard for two and a half hours. On the skateboard, going down a hill, two feet off, do it again, do it again. You know, the little boy was laughing, the little boy was crying, the little boy skinned his knee, the dad was having a nervous breakdown. We had to, you know, we had to have lunch. There was a twig in the way. Then she wanted the twig in the way. Then she took the twig away. Then we had to wait for the, you know, the clouds to pass. Absolute dedication. Always, you know, a smile on her face, a slightly nervous smile at times, but completely in control of the situation and absolutely dogged about staying until she gets it right. I've always worked from home because my hours are so all over the place and very long, and it gives me flexibility. I shoot away about two months a year, mainly in the state, you know, from the Kimberley down to the Great Southern. And, you know, you're leaving at really unusual hours or work till late, so it just makes sense. And um, I invest that extra expense into really good staff, particularly with digital photography, because you really need that and that support. And um, so, yeah, it's, and also in an office, you know, we walk through the garden and it's up in, in the office and we can have the windows open, breathe fresh air, hear the birds, smell the flowers. So for my team and I, we just, it's perfect. There's a lot of areas here dedicated just to photography. It's a beautiful environment to work in. I have more space, most probably. I think to be successful in any creative field, you've got to have a real passion for your work. I guess that's something we both have. Uh, she takes the stills, I take the moving pictures, and uh, we love our work, but it ain't easy, you know. Uh, it does require enormous amounts of time and effort. I think our work methods are similar in that we both strive for perfection. We don't care what lengths we go to to achieve it or the hours we put in to achieve it. And I think it's one of the reasons why uh, Francis's clients keep asking her back for more and more and more because they know every time they engage her to do a job, they, uh, she delivers something extraordinary. Initially, you know, it was photographing friends and self-assignments, uh, mainly kind of black and white reportage because I didn't have to earn a living out of it. I just did what I wanted. When I decided not to go back to teaching and uh, that was something I wanted to pursue on a part-time level, um, I was just lucky I got these incredible breaks, you know. A producer I was working for at Channel 9 recommended me to the Bulletin, which is now no longer a magazine. Next thing was The Good Weekend, and it was the first portrait of Janet Holmes Accord since Robert Holmes Accord's death. It was hugely prestigious, major story. It was about her art collection. So it was just sort of, in those days, the visibility of magazines was much greater than now. You know, magazines are now on their decline. When I first started photography professionally, 85% of my work was editorial. Now. I've cut that right back, their budgets are cut back, um, and I pick and choose what I want to do, still do Good Weekend, still do Gourmet Traveller. When I first started in photography, of course, it was all film-based, not digital as it is now. 
you know, I had my own dark room, which I spent many, many hours with smelly chemicals. <laughs> Don't miss that. You know, it was also, you had to really be skillful in what you were doing. You know, there was many occasions I would shoot a job on transparency, which is slide film, which has no leeway for error. And suddenly you're accruing it to Sydney to be on the cover of a magazine and, and you haven't even seen the shots. I guess getting that interesting work straight away made me realise that this is what I wanted to pursue. And, you know, even now, after all the pictures, all the assignments, it's still, I have a buzz. I think Woody Allen, the film director, once said, 80% uh, of success is showing up. Well, in Francis's case, it usually means uh, being, you know, but first light in a vineyard in Margaret River or something, you know, she'll leave at 5 or 4.30 in the morning, travel in darkness, go there, get set up, and be there ready to capture that first light, that first bit of sunlight, you know, hitting a, uh, some grapes. You've got to be there to get those extraordinary images. And, uh, and the same goes, you know, late in the evening, you know, getting a sunset uh, over a surf break or whatever. So uh, I've seen the hours she puts in, and you can only do that if you have an incredible passion for the job. And that's something she just has in spades. She's just a born photographer. Probably the most challenging assignment was in 1999, and it was uh, doing the stills for a stage production of You're Living Dangerously by Black Swan Theatre Company. But that involved not just taking ordinary pictures, I actually had to go to Surabaya in Indonesia, which looked like Jakarta in the 60s and take photographs from the viewpoint of an Australian Chinese dwarf cinema photographer who was pretty obsessed with the poverty there. I read the novel once, just read it through. Then I watched the movie Year of Living Dangerously and then I went through a second time and photocopied pages that were relevant. I felt totally equipped to start shooting. I guess the other challenging assignment, and again it was overseas, and, and again I guess you're dealing with uh, compromised societies or compromised groups and societies was the South African AIDS um, project. I went over there with an organisation called Equal Health and they work in impoverished areas. I chose to go or got invited to go to Johannesburg in an area called Hillbrow, which is the most violent non-combat zone in the world where HIV is rife. And we stayed in a hospice where patients were living and treated. And these were homeless people mainly. So it's an organisation that wanted a photographer to help show the work they've done so people support them more financially. It was so visually rich and you wanted to just go on the streets like I did in Indonesia, but the safety component was not something the organisation wanted to wear and I would endanger the program. So I had to and be more selfless. As a photographer, I think it's a selfish thing. You really are wanting to get to the heart of something. You, you want to get the best possible shot. Doing this project in South Africa or Indonesia or Moscow where I've worked on the streets, it, you really aren't just watching the news. You actually are in the heart of it, in the thick of it. And, and you are um, photographing people and talking to them. And, and it's always, for me, the way I feel less that I'm exploiting these people is you get their stories. Because every time I've done anything like this, it is either a magazine or an exhibition where people hear hopefully we'll get to care about them more because they are reading their story. I met this, this man, this 
extra extraordinary story because he was 80 years old before he started work. His wife became very ill and he decided that he was going to paint, made a pact with God that while he painted, his wife Joyce would be alive. And in about three or four years, he filled the house, literally floor to ceiling. You could hardly move through it, full of paintings. Really, I only had one choice of a photographer when I thought of this project because it was complex. It required somebody with enormous sensitivity, a fantastic eye, an ability to capture ambience as much as just everyday detail. And I'd worked with Francis before and I just thought this would be a great project for us. It turned out to be very long and arduous, and, uh, but because we do work well together and because I know, have total confidence in Francis that if I say, you know, look, we really need something like this, she will come up with the quintessential image that just sums that up. I was born in Croatia in a village town called Blato. It's on an island in Korčula, which is um, near Dubrovnik along the Dalmatian coast, very beautiful area. My parents decided to migrate to Australia uh, because of the poverty in Croatia. Uh, there was a promise of a better life here. When my father arrived, he arrived 10 months before my mother, which was quite common in those days to set things up and smooth the transition over. And then my mother arrived with me in 1960 and I was four years old. It was a culture shock for both my parents. It was easier for my father because he had his parents here. He had a grandmother and aunties, but my mother came here with no family at all, other than my father's family. And so there were all her friends, her parents, her brother and sister she left behind and she cried every day <laughs> for about a year. And you know, letters would be three months to six months. So um, very difficult. So very soon they realised that it was hard to save up for a house. So like most migrant families, they went to work in Carnarvon, which was sort of further north, of course, and they had a banana and vegetable plantation that they uh, worked on very hard, incredible hours. And I guess that's sort of what I grew up around, parents that work very hard. <laughs> that was normal to me. <laughs> I used to look forward to going back to school and after the holidays because I was in charge of the irrigation on the farm. So I used to help my parents run the farm and look after my brother and sisters, so school was easy. You know, they saved up enough money to buy a home and some investment properties. And I've been back quite a few times. I uh, went back and visited family and stayed with family. I speak Croatian. Um, I speak it with a very heavy dialect. So I speak it like people used to speak it 50 years ago, 100 years ago. So when I do go back, older people go, oh, you're from the village Blato? And I go, yep, because <laughs> it's more universal now. Recently, I went back and took my two daughters. It was actually in 2006. I had an exhibition in Split in, uh, uh, the girls came and stayed with family and they'd never done that before. And I took them back to the house that I was born in, that my father's family owned. It was in ruins because no one had lived there since we'd left. And this is what happened all through the village. People would go to Argentina, America, North America, Canada and Australia. They migrated in those places. And of course, whole homes were just left as they were the day the people left. Maybe there were squatters sometimes. You've grown up with these two cultures, very strict upbringing, very difficult when you're a teenager, all your friends can go to parties and you can't. But, you know, you have parents who are so giving and generous. You know, my mother still, my father recently passed away, but I never used to call out a handyman in my life. And they did it with such pleasure. You know, and my mother's whole life is cooking for her children, grandchildren. That's her greatest pleasure, is to be generous to us. So I've, I've grown up with that. And uh, parents who work really hard, who put everything they have into what they do, and they do it to their best ability. So that's a fantastic thing to grow up around, and lots of love. So um, could have done with a <laughs> more fun teenage years, but um, that's a small cost.
That was for a cover story for the West magazine in 1999. He came along with the publicist. He's just done two movies and you know, he was a rising star. He expected it to be a, a little tiny shoot and he was really pleased when it was, I was trying to do something really edgy and creative because he is like that. He had a great interest in photography and uh, remembered me from when I photographed him as a 16 year old. And uh, he really, he, he's, he obviously wanted to be a director more than an actor. And uh, you would just come up with an idea and he'd run with it and really enjoyed working collaboratively. We did quite a few, uh, and with his family, and that was a great privilege, and he showed me a lot of his pictures in here. He'd come in here and sit down and we'd look through his shots and he wanted to hear what I thought. When we went into the Jacksu kitchen, which was incredible, <laughs> we kind of thought about what we would do and um, he, you know, there was all this stuff around and you gave him a cue about energy and, you know, the exuberance of youth and talent. And he just kind of picked up a saucepan and started, you know, I kind of talked about jumping and stuff, but he picked up a saucepan and started, you know, he, he you know, he had that intuitiveness. The picture of tap dogs um, was taken as part of the publicity for the show with, that was touring the world. It was a pretty huge hit. Dean Perry, the choreographer, um, had started a second crew and um, these guys were just hired that day. So they weren't perfect like the first crew I'd photographed who were the guys who went on to you know, dance in New York and everywhere else. This was the second crew. And we just had some it's a red soil put in and it was about 42 degrees the day we did that shoot. And the boys um, just did that dance and um, almost, you know, the heat. I think one boot just about melted. It was so hot. I first met Trevor Jameson as a 17-year-old. He was uh, a lead in Brand New Day, Black Swan production of an Indigenous uh, musical. We had to make it feel like it was about his Spinifex people, but of course by the time we found a spot, because we couldn't photograph near his community because there was a funeral, so there was a hold up in actually taking the pictures, it went overcast in Kalgoorlie, in January, when it's sunny every day. So I put up a, one of my portable studio flashes and lit him, polarised the clouds and of course made him have more light than in real, real life. And so what that did was produced, it looks photoshopped but it's not. That was shot on my Hasselblad on transparency. But also there are three great loves, dance, I love photographing dance. I love doing portraiture and I love the Australian landscape. So that photograph for me has my three loves, you know, combined in one. And dance for me, I love it because you get sometimes things that are unpredictable and dancers really are in tune with their bodies. So, you, you know, you don't necessarily say, I want you to do this. You, you might talk to them about something and then they'll take the cue and run with it. And you'll go, yeah, and especially these days, it's fantastic with digital, you can show them straight away. But you're very much a conduit, you know, to get the picture. You know, they are giving you uh, what, especially if you're working with a choreographer who really knows what they're doing or a dancer, they will give you the most photogenic kicks or whatever, movements. And um, it's one of my favourite things to do because of that unpredictability and it's beautiful and it's fluid and uh, you're working with people that are very talented and very disciplined and I love that.
Thank mm-hmm. you.